DNA again, but this time it's not about methylation, it's about touch DNA and the persistence of DNA. Yeah. So I had a case in which a guy read the newspapers, gave it to his neighbor, his neighbor was killed, mm -hmm. and then the DNA of the other neighbor who had read the newspaper first was convicted of the crime because the DNA of him was now on the victim. But he said he was never at his neighbor's, he just put the newspaper on the doorstep. Do you believe do you believe that? Absolutely. Actually, uh, part of my results kind of shows that. So here for participant D, um, we noted for the sec we separated each ruler that the participant held in nine segments. So that's what this table is showing. In participant D specifically, the fourth and eighth segments, when they were ran as single sources, they were excluded from the sample. But when they were when the same segments were ran as two or more sources, they were included in that sample because of foreign DNA. So because of the way that touch DNA works, that is something that is very possible and actually happens constantly. We, we just heard in a talk just a, an hour ago that even on uh, bullet cases, you can have touch DNA and it's mixed all the time. Yeah. So how do you deal with all the mixtures? I mean, are you just using computer programs or do you like, you know, determine a threshold yeah. level for every single case by yourself? How do you do that? Um, for my study specifically, uh, we use StarMix to um, kind of discuss those likelihood ratios of how likely it was that that person contributed to their sample. Um, and we also um, observed their electropharograms. So for example, most of the samples that we took, it was only detectable to see one person contributing to that sample, and it was generally that participant's um, DNA that was added to that. But in this electropharogram here, you can see that there are three different alleles detected in different spots. So that's clear that there's a mixture. One person can only have two alleles at one point. So, yeah. so wh wh how did you deal with that? Uh, we just noted it. You know, the, the point of this poster is just to detect the inconsistencies of transfer and touch DNA in that and in a forensic setting. So it is likely that even when you know that there's only one contributor to a sample, because we didn't control for people washing their hands beforehand, we clearly see that there was foreign DNA deposited that did not belong to the participant that was still deposited on the rulers that they handled. Same with the shell casings. Even though these were fresh shell casings that were fired once, there was DNA of several persons yeah. on the casings. Nobody knows why. So. Do you, do you want to continue this path because it's probably going to cause nightmares for you because all this touching and mixing? I mean. Right. It might, but I think it's very important to have these conversations, you know, to discuss with the public and everybody willing to listen within and outside of the field that these cases can happen. You know, DNA and the systems that we use are very sensitive and can help us solve crimes and all of these things, but it can also make it very difficult. And I think that's something that needs to be very transparent when discussing touch DNA and how it affects the criminal process. How do you take care of your DNA so that when you're riding a bus, not all your DNA is uh, like everywhere and then you get accused <laughs> of a crime that happens two hours later? Do you have any suggestions? <laughs> Use hand sanitizer and try to touch as least amount of surfaces as possible. <laughs> how about the skin flakes that are falling down? That's just, you can't, you can't help it. You're, just, you just hope that nobody cream, near you cream. committed a crime. <laughs> use cream yeah. and a hairnet. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Thanks.